Hi, welcome to Seize Your Mind, the podcast about soccer, mental toughness, and life. I'm your host, Brandon Stone. Today, I have two guests, Brad Miller, a clinical psychologist that specializes in working with athletes, and Wells Thompson, a former MLS player, but as he mentioned before, once a player, always a player. In his mind, he's still a player. So, welcome right. to the show, guys. Um, Thank you. Want to start off with uh, just give me a little bit of background. We'll start off with you, Brad. Um, how did you get into psychology? How did you get into working with athletes? Tell me a little bit about your background. All right. Well, it's actually kind of they, they both kind of merged together. When I was uh, so I went to Wake Forest um, to play uh, soccer. And go Deeks. So when, that's right. Go Deeks. And uh, so when I was there, um, I, I, was, I didn't know what to major in, right? So I was a business major. So I was playing soccer. I was a business major. And to get to the last, kind of like my senior year, they started doing interviews, um, you know, for like accounting firms and banks and things and finance. And I was like, I, I just don't know if that's me. I just didn't feel right. And so my buddy, uh, John Hackworth, who um, is now the, the coach of Louisville FC, he goes, Miller, why don't you be a psychologist? We all talk to you all the time on bus trips anyway. And all of a sudden this light bulb went off. I'm like, psychologist, I could be a psychologist. I'm like, all right. Had never taken a single psychology class, never talked to a psychology a psychologist before. And I was like, but it just felt really good. So I uh, stuck around for uh, another year. I, I uh, mono my junior year. So I had next year of eligibility. So I minored in psych. And then I graduated and I was like, you know, I, okay, I want to kind of help people. So started, you know, graduate school being a psychologist and, I was thinking a lot about my days at Wake Forest, right? That for me, soccer was this place when I was a kid, I just loved soccer, right? It was my place to get away stress from home and life. And I just was like free and comfortable. And it was a great sort of therapy for me. And when I got to college at Wake, it was a real challenge. Like all of a sudden, you know, there was this, you know, pressure of trying to kind of work my way into getting more playing time. And my technical skills were not nearly where they needed to be. And so I've had a lot of performance things, which I'd never felt and kind of had this love hate relationship with soccer along the way. And when I left and started graduate school and started, then got my license, started working with athletes and realized that they had performance anxiety too. And I kind of thought, well, what can we do to kind of help them? So we came together, we worked on strategies and they would take it and they would apply those things and it got better. And so that's kind of where soccer and psychology merged and it became a real passion of working with athletes and, soccer and in different sports and uh that's kind of how i got into psychology and uh in soccer and ironically um that one of the things that shaped me as a psychologist is a book by carol dweck called mindset and my friend john hackworth again when he was coaching the philadelphia union's head coach he was the one who kind of showed me that book so i kind of laughed that he's kind of guided me um into this position here i am today interesting interesting it's it's very cool to be able to see you know you help someone with their with with their mind and then it pay off in actual physical results on the field. Very very rewarding. Yeah, it really is. You know, so when I was going through all that performance things, I'd often think like, man, how come I couldn't have got it together when I played? I could have made it so much better at Wake. I would have enjoyed it more, and I wouldn't have been as stressed. And all of that had wonderful friendships and experiences. I could have gotten more, and I kind of had this regret. But then as time goes on, I've realized that that was really a gift for me because now I can really relate to the players who have that performance anxiety and the stress. And I really know what that feels like. So I'm really motivated to help them not go through the things that I went through as a player. And that's a huge reason why Wells and I have, you know, teamed up to really try to give back and help athletes to get the most out of their experience and enjoy it more. Amazing. Wells, tell me about you. How'd you get into soccer? How did you go into pro soccer? What's yeah. What's your journey been like? Yeah, man. I, I just, I, I was an athlete growing up, played everything. Soccer was probably my most, um, I was most talented in soccer, probably, you know, God had given me the most gifts in soccer. So the older I got, the more I, you know, prioritized soccer and that sort of thing. I'm um, a little bit of an underdog story. You know, I, I, I got into a lot of trouble as a kid. So drugs and alcohol is a big part of my past. So I wasn't really getting heavily recruited to play college soccer. Um, I grew up in Winston-Salem. Ironically, me and Brad grew up like three, five minutes from each other, uh, went to the same college. I'm a little bit older than he is, or the other way around, whichever way you want to see it. 
And uh, so um, I knew the coaches at Wake Forest. I knew Jay Vidovich, uh, Bobby Muse at the time was the assistant coach. Uh, Paul Forrester was the assistant coach. And because of my my past, you know, I, I had some offers from, from from some really good schools, but uh, I knew um, that that the greatest opportunity for me to to play or to play at the best level and to also get a phenomenal education was to go to Wake Forest. And so one of the greatest decisions I ever made. And uh, yeah, so um, obviously if you know anything about college soccer, you know, Wake Forest is a, is a powerhouse and has been for the last 20 years. And so um, I was just a recruiter walk on. They actually told me when I got drafted in 2007, the coaches did. They said, they said that they thought I'd never play at Wake Forest. And so, you know, obviously I proved them wrong. I said, gee, guys, thanks so much for the uh, confidence in me. I'm kidding. Uh, but, uh, you know, I just kind of an underdog mentality. And I, I tried out for the state team as a kid and, and never made it um, year after year. Um, and so I look back and, and on those experiences, and I know that prepared me for going to Wake and then prepared me for the pro level. So I had a decent college career, um, made it to the Final Four our senior year, ended up losing in PKs to UC Santa Barbara, uh, went to the MLS Combine, and then um, kind of surprisingly was drafted fifth overall in 2007. And so, yeah, it was a dream come true, man. Played nine years, wish I was still playing, but so grateful for uh, just that opportunity. I mean, I never thought I'd play a day in college soccer, so to, to make it to the pro level was obviously fantastic. Have a favorite moment in in the, your pro pro uh, career, like a favorite goal or or experience that just like that was one of the peaks. Yeah, I mean, I think being drafted. So it's kind of a funny story. Jay Vidovich called me into his office two days before the draft, and he said, "You you and your family need to fly up to Indianapolis." And so if you're a first, you know, top 10 pick, first round pick, the league flies you up and takes care of you. Well, we flew, me and my, my mom and dad flew up ourselves and, you know, it comes time for the draft. And I knew that there were several teams interested in me. And my dad, like, w when it comes time for the draft, we go into the room and there's a section cordoned off for their players and their parents. And my dad books it to the front row. And I'm a little bit nervous. I'm like, I'm going to be that kid that just sits here and doesn't get picked. And, you know, kudos to my dad. He just wanted to have the best seat in the house. And I would have done the absolutely same thing. Uh, but I was there with uh, one of my my best friends and, and college teammates, Ryan Solly. And so I knew the Revolution were interested in me. They had the 11th pick, and they traded up to get the fifth pick. And I was like, oh, crap, there goes my chances, right? <laughs> I mean, they had drafted some scrubs in the past, like Clint Dempsey and Michael Parkhurst. And I'm kidding, all-stars, right? Like really, really good players and a good team. And um, uh, so the fifth pick comes up and they go midfielder from Wake Forest and both me and Ryan are midfielders and uh, they say my name and it was like a dream, man. I I stood up and hugged my, my parents and hugged Ryan and his family and just tried not to trip walking up the stairs to shake the commissioner's hand. And so, I mean, that that's obviously like what you dream about, you know, come draft day, you actually get drafted, you're on the stage, you get to take a picture with the commissioner, or give a speech, those sorts of things. Um, obviously, I've had a lot of really great experiences. Won the MLS Cup, scored the game-winning goal to win the U.S. Open Cup. Um, but, you know, when I think back in my career, it's, it's, it's not necessarily those things. It's the people that I've met and uh, just my teammates, my coaches. Like, the, the single greatest thing that soccer ever gave me was exposing me to the world, right? Like, I got to travel the world and play soccer and meet people from all over the world, and that's something that no trophy could ever replace. Man, isn't that the truth? Soccer definitely provides you unique opportunities and, and bonds with people that you just don't get with any any other sport. I mean, not to that level, at least. Yeah, you know, Dad, I think that's really come to the, to the forefront for me lately is because I've, and this is kind of how me and Brad connected, but um, I started a podcast called The Shift Podcast. So it's um, a focus on helping athletes transition to life after sport and also leveraging uh, current pro athletes, leveraging their platform to prepare for life after sport. And so we've got to sit down and, and, and zoom and podcast with a bunch of my old teammates and man, it's just been super cool just to reconnect and to, um, to see what they're up to and, and that sort of thing. So that's kind of how me and Brad connected. I think he heard about us on, um, even though we grew up five minutes from each other, we had never met. And we had heard about each other, Wake Forest community, family, you know, it's one of the awesome, 
best things about Wake Forest is the family atmosphere. Um, but anyway, he heard one of our podcasts and reached out, and um, the rest is history, as they say. Nice. How long have y'all been working together now? It's about two months. Okay. Is that right, Wells? Yeah, a couple months, yeah. And tell me about this project y'all are working on. Go ahead, Brad. Yeah, so, uh, you know, when, when, when Wells and I connected, um, you know, we, we started talking and Wells has, you know, been working for years, uh, you know, with, with uh, kids and through training, coaching, and I've been doing some presentations to soccer teams and we kind of talked about that mutual passion we had for helping, helping kids and helping them learn how to be resilient to manage the challenges of, you know, not only soccer, but things off the soccer field. And uh, we just kind of hit it off and, and, and that really kind of inspired us both. And we thought if we combine forces, right, what could we be able to do? And that's kind of what, what we're doing now. You know, we're, we're really excited. We're, um, you, uh, we presented to a high school team, a club team, a soccer team, or I'm sorry, a college team. And, uh, you know, we're looking to really partner up with a club where, you know, as you hear Wells talk right about relationships, and he said that you know the MLS Cup was amazing, the Open Cup was amazing, but it's the relationships you have, and you know, in addition to Wells's experience and you know things as a player, me as a psychologist, that you know I think one of our greatest strengths too is connecting and relating to people, and that's really where I think you make an impact and difference. And we're looking to really partner with a club where we can kind of have a club as a mutual vision that we do, and not sort of they take our vision but we have a similar one we come together and we can really work on making some changes in kids lives helping them learn how to be more resilient on the field you know kind of learn to, to embrace those challenges we want them to really want the challenge to see the possible benefits and growth that can come from it and how to overcome those adversities whatever the size is in front of them and we know with COVID-19 right now there's so many difficult things we're all trying to struggle with and kids need that support more than ever and college players and professional players as well. Anything yeah, to add to that one? Yeah, yeah, I think, I mean, Brad hit upon that in, in the introduction, you know, um, it's the essence of life and that, and we truly believe that it's, you know, we go through, we go through things for a reason and it's not just for ourselves, uh, but for other people, um, you know, a catchy way to say it is our pain becomes our purpose. And so, I mean, I'm sure you experience this, Brandon, like the older you get, the more you, um, um, you start to, you know, understand what life's about. Right. And so relationships, for example, is one thing that Brad hits hit on. And I've said that my whole life, but I'm just really understanding that and learning it and growing in that. And so for me, um, you know, talk about the underdog mentality. I think one of my greatest assets as a player was my, my mental toughness, my mental strength. And, you know, I just thrived off that stuff. Like you doubt me, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to kick your butt. And, and, and it doesn't matter who I'm playing. Like I'm going to, I'm going to make it pretty hard for you. Right. And I was just a competitor to the core and still am. Um, but, but somewhere along the way, and I'm not sure what happened or, or, or when, uh, but my greatest asset became my greatest detriment. And so, you know, sport is such a microcosm of life. Um, everything that the sport teaches you um, can be applied and correlates to life. And so, you know, looking hindsight's twenty twenty, right? So looking back on my career, um, I, I think back to how often did I train my body? And I know you can't see my body now, but no, I'm kidding. Um, it was a lot, right? I trained my body a lot. And uh, how often did I train my mind? And it, it wasn't much. And yes, it was kind of so it was um, how often did I like uh, 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 intentionally train my mind, right? right? And, it, and it wasn't, it wasn't a lot. And so, you know, the older I get, the more I understand that so much of life is lived between the ears. And at the end of the day, like, I truly believe like that's, you know, because your, um, your strengths are, are minimalized, the, the, the higher you rise in competition, right? Like you're just looking for millimeters to separate yourself from the next guy so that you can play over him and so you can beat him and that sort of thing. And uh, I, I think it's probably one of the greatest untapped. Um, and, and I think there's been a lot of conversation around it now and people are starting to believe in it. Like me and Brad joke, like if you, if you ask a coach or a player how important is training your mind, they're all going to say yes. Um, but if you ask them if they want to spend some money to do it, they'll say no. And so, I mean, I, I, personal experience, like when I was in Colorado, 
Um, our coach, Gary Smith, he paid for every single body, every person on the team um, to have one free session with a sports psychologist. And so I went to the first free session, but I didn't go back because I didn't want to pay the money. And now I'm like, man, you are an idiot. <laughs> Why would you not? That's an investment in, in your career, in your life. And so um, since I retired from the game, I've looked to kind of fill that competitive void and I got into ultra running. And so ultra running is running anything farther than a marathon. And in, in May, I ran my first 100 mile race. I ran 100 miles. And so to me, at the end of the day, yes, it's a physical test, right? But really, it's mental. We can do far more than we're capable of, or that we can do far more than we tell ourselves we're capable of. And so it's really a lot of it comes down to just your mindset, um, your mentality, the thoughts that you have. There's so much that goes into it. So, you know, me and Brad are kind of the one two punch combo. He's the, uh, the, the clinical psychologist and, and, and a lot of this stuff like visualizations and affirmations I've gotten into post career. And so I wish I could go back and say, and so that's part of it for us is like, we want to help kids with not only becoming better athletes, um, but all these things that we teach can be applied to, to life outside of the sport. So ultimately we care about them as individuals and becoming better human beings. And that right there, caring about them as people, that's why you guys are going to be successful. I know it. No, much appreciated, man. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, and then I also wanted to add, when you talked about, you saw that one psychologist and how it was a, it was an investment. And the cool thing about it is that's something you do that doesn't expire you get to take that knowledge for the rest of your life and you don't have to pay <laughs> you have to like keep paying the what do you call it fees on those like you pay once and it's yours for life so whoever does decide to work with you like they pay you once and they get to keep that and and uh, it never expires yeah, no doubt. I mean, I think just life in general is, is tough, right? It, life is great, but it's also tough. And, um, you know, Brad talked a little bit about COVID, but I mean, there's so many, there's so many pressures that kids face these days. I mean, for me, I, and I, I shared a little bit about it, but like my parents had to intervene in my life to save my life. Um, I was gonna, because of the decisions I was making, I was going to end up in jail for a really long time or dead. Um, and so if my parents didn't, didn't intervene like there's no telling where I would be right now and um, so that's my heart like I know I didn't go through all that mess to just keep it for myself but to share it for other people and I think the older that you get the more you realize that true fulfillment comes from giving and not and not getting and do I always operate from that mindset no like I'm a selfish screwed up individual and I've got a whole lot of problems. My wife will tell you, right? Um, but I try. And, and I know that like people on their deathbed aren't, aren't like, hey, can I see my MLS championship ring again? They're like, I want to talk to my son or daughter again. And so it's, I think part of it is just, it's, um, you know, it's why I, I love teaming with guys like Brad. I mean, we're better together. And so we remind each other of like, this is really what, this is our core purpose. This is what we're trying to do. And uh, this is how we're trying to impact the world for the better. Yeah. Anything to add to that, Brad? Yeah, you know, you know, I really like, you know, that Wells, you know, brought up about sort of when we're, you know, that the struggles we have and, you know, what helps us kind of get through that, that, you know, I think that Wells and I share that passion that when you get the opportunity to help someone have some strategies in front of them. You know, I've told Wells that so many times, you know, Brandon, that somebody will come in to see me and, you know, Wells and I are very strength-based, right? We're really focused on, you know, what are your strengths? Because I always like to start with what, what works for you now, what works, maybe not 100%, but what works. And so a lot of times we forget, you know, our brain's wired to notice the negative much more than the positive. And so, you know, we can tell you what's not working, but a lot of times we have lots of things that do help. So if we start with what are your strengths and then we can build on those and add things in, but, you know, we, we look at ourselves as a strategy, as a resource. And yes, you know, Wells is a nine-year professional, I'm a 20-year clinical psychologist, but we have strategies, right? And when people, like you said, that, that you can take the information, it always stays with you. But we really encourage people to, you know, think of strategies. That's just the key in trying to figure out how to make improvement, get through hard times, right? We often think that, you know, it's just sort of, it's not going to work out. I'm not going to get through it. That's who I am. I'm just a stress case. I just get mad a lot. And that's the end of the story. 
and there's so much more to our story, right? That as well as about ultra running, you can push yourself if you've got certain thoughts and strategies to help you do it. So if I just said, hey, Wells, I haven't really ran very much. I've had three knee surgeries, but I'll just go run 100 miles. Even if my heart's totally in it, I'm going to need some strategies. Like, Wells, what do you do when it's like mile 20 and your heart is pounding out of your chest and your feet and your hips are killing you? What do you do? I need some strategies and tools. And when you take hard work and strategies and put them together, what you are capable of learning and growing is really limitless. And, uh, you know, Wells, can you share that? What you told me a while back, you said, at mile 50, what, what was going through your head and, and what was your strategy to help you get to 100? Yeah, I don't know if, if I'm going to say what you're thinking I'm going to say, but I would, when things started hurting, because in, inevitably things are going to hurt when you're running that kind of distance, I would say, I feel great. I feel great. I feel great. And I would just repeat that to myself over and over again. And so a lot of these things, like, I mean, before, as a younger person, I would say, it's a little bit hokey pokey, right? Like, ah, I feel great. I feel great. But like, I think that we can almost trick ourselves. And this is where, where Brad's expertise is, but like, we can trick ourselves to believe in things. And so um, we go where we focus. So, you know, are you going to focus on the positive or the negative? Because you can find it out there. You might have to look a little bit harder for the positive, but you can find it. And so, uh, so much of that is like, what am I filling my mind? My, it's like, I always think of this when I talk about it. It's like, you remember when you're a young kid and your parents don't want you to watch rated R movies? Oh, yeah. Like, I understand why they just want us to watch them now, right? Because it fills your mind. And I'm really careful now. I, don't, I really try not to watch news um, because this stuff's just so negative and, and um, horrible. But, um, you know, what we fill our minds, our heads, our hearts, our eyes, our ears with affects us and so is that what you're talking about brad i was actually thinking of how yeah uh, what you said you said at mile 50 i just told myself you're feeling great you're feeling great yeah you're feeling great right and 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 yeah i'm glad you brought that point up wells right that a lot of times people hear that and go well that doesn't work <laughs> you know and it's you've used affirmations a lot right you've told yourself things a lot you know in our brain they call it the big word neuroplasticity. It just means the brain changes with experience. That's how we learn a language. That's how we learn things on a computer. That's how we learn, you know, uh, algebra. And so the more we put positive thoughts in our head, the more we focus on having a plan for those thoughts when times are difficult, we actually create more neural connections in the brain and we're more primed to be positive or thinking about ways to push through. And it's kind of like this, like how many times have you guys, like, uh, remember the last time you're looking for a car, right? You're maybe on your phone, you're online, you're looking for a car, okay? And it's really on your mind. And then all of a sudden you get on the freeway or in parking lots, you're like, man, that car is like everywhere. Where is it before? It's not that all of a sudden like the car dealership said, hey, let's just put a bunch of Hondas all over the road so Brad's going to get it, is that what happened is, is our brain is primed to notice what we tell it to notice. When we say, hey brain, this is important, the brain goes, okay, cool, I'm gonna focus on it. So because we're so focused on the car, now we see it much more than before. We block out other stuff and we hyper-focus on that. But then you ever notice that once you've had the car and it's been maybe three, four, five, six months, you don't really notice the other cars as much. And after a couple of years, it's not even a big deal. Same thing, we told the brain it's not important anymore. So when Wells is running, and he tells his brain, I feel good, I feel good, I feel good. His brain's had a lot of practice in him being in pain and him hurting and him telling himself, you got this, keep pushing, keep pushing. And he's built more neural connections in the brain and like a muscle, that part of his brain is now stronger and that's why he can do it. If you've almost never tried that in your life and then you do, it's gonna not be nearly as effective because you haven't built the strength in that part of the brain yet. You haven't built up that muscle. So thinking positive doesn't really work, but repeatedly thinking about how to push through over and over again and training your brain to focus on those things, that does work. That's very well put. I mean, it's absolutely true. You, um, those car, the negative and the positive, like the cars, the cars always been out there. The negative and the positive are both always out there but it's what, what are you training your mind to see? Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 you know, with, with that negative too, something that, you know, I don't know if a lot of people know, but our brain has a negative bias, which means it's wired to notice the negative thing. And it's really about survival, right? I kind of think of our brains like uh, a two story house, the bottom floor 
is just like the animal brain. And the animal brain is wired for survival, right? Not like our, you know, cats and dogs in a house, I mean, out in the wild, it's about survival, minute to minute, hour to hour, day to day. And their brains are on hyper alert. They're not worried like, dude, are your spots cooler than mine? How come the herd's not talking to me? They're they're hanging out with Brandon. They don't worry about those things, right? It's about survival. And that's the bottom part of our brain. And sometimes we refer to it as the emotional brain. So that part of the brain is just constantly looking out for all kinds of danger. But we've evolved where we've got a second floor on top of our brain in the second floor, we can do things animals can't do. We can think about, uh, we can think about past, present, and future. We understand the concept of time. We can, you know, do pros and cons, do two or three choices and weigh them out. We can do rational thought. We can reason. Those are things we can do. Animals can't do that, right? We can think about our thinking. <laughs> right. Well, it's kind of like, uh, Brandon, do you have a dog or cat? I have a dog. Okay. Do you, does your dog ever get like spooked about something. There's like a sound or a noise and your dog gets spooked or barks and it's no, there's no, there's no threat, but your dog just keeps doing it anyway. All the time. Yeah. What's, what's something that sets off your dog? When I move my wheelchair, it makes a little click. Yeah. Yeah. Every time so he can be dead asleep so, and he'll jump up. Yeah. Yeah. So here's how that works, right? So in the animal brain that it is to survive, you've got to know where the danger is, right? So let's say we are all like uh, in Africa, we're gazelles, right? We're the prey animals, we're the hunted. So we're super fast, which is cool, but we're really appetizing to the cheetahs and tigers and that kind of sucks, right? So let's say we go to a watering hole. Okay, cool, it's hot. It's like there's tall grass all around us and it's super hot and there's water like, yes, we got all of our friends around. We put our head down to get some water and at the corner of our eye, we look out and all of a sudden we see some movement tall grass and something springs from the grass, it's a cheetah. So now the animal brain's got three choices, right? I can either fight, flight, or freeze. Freeze sounds like a really bad choice because I'm going to be lunch in about two seconds. So that's off the table. Fighting the cheetah, eh, not so good, but flight, yeah, I've got wheels, let's run. So they choose flight, so they take off, right? If you outrun a cheetah, and cheetahs, you know, I guess they can go for about like 60 seconds or something, and then they kind of like stop. So if you can outrun the cheetah, now you have survived, but that's only part of the story. If you wanna keep surviving, your animal brain's gotta go, okay, dude, so like, how do I actually learn from this and work? Well, what the brain's gonna do, in the animal brain, it's gonna go, cheetahs are dangerous, well, we knew that to check, but now tall grass is dangerous, movement in tall grass is dangerous, being by a big source of water is dangerous, and being by a big group of prey animals is dangerous, and all of those things are equally dangerous. So now, you know, we all outran the cheetah, we're walking along and we see tall grass and we flip out and we're on hyper alert and we're feeling panic and dread like the cheetah's there. And then we walk along and we see this small rodent in the tall grass and we freak out again because the brain's like movements in tall grass is dangerous. We now see prey animals before we're like, oh, sweet dude, Brandon Wells, our crew, we're together, let's hang out. Now the animal brain's like, uh-uh, I'm not going near those people, that's dangerous. And now water, which we need, it's really hot got to survive. I don't want any water because that's when I'm going to die. So that's how the animal brain works. The animal brain has no concept of past, present, and future. And let's say we're those gazelles. And now out here, Brandon, we have something in Wells called the Wild Animal Park in Escondido. It's really cool. It's a huge place. They can like roam really around. They kind of separate the prey animals and the, and, the, and, and the predatory animals. But let's say we're all there. It's 15 years later, we've been kicking back, we got our food delivered, life is good as gazelles, everything's cool, and we see movement in tall grass, and to our brain, it feels exactly like it did 15 years ago when that cheetah sprung from the grass and we ran for our life. Because the animal brain has no concept of time. Uh, what's your dog's name, Brandon? Shadow. I'm sorry, Shadow? Shadow, yeah. Yeah, so Shadow is gonna keep doing that day after day, week after week, year after year, unless you hire like the dog whisperer, and I'm not the dog whisperer, so I don't know how that all works, but their brain, Shadow's brain is gonna do that repeatedly. And we have that as part of our brain, and that's what happens to us with negative events. You know, if I'm playing soccer, and I'm uh, playing at midfield, and the ball comes to me like a poor first touch, they take it from me, they counter and they score, my brain, the animal part of my brain is like, okay, dude, it is horrifically dangerous for you to get the ball at midfield. So now my brain's like, uh-uh, Miller, don't touch the ball at midfield. I'm like, hey, coach, can I go play in the back? Can I play up top? I'm like, well, 
Wells, don't pass me the ball. Seriously, don't pass me the ball, man. I'm just, it's just not good. So my brain, the amp brain wants me to avoid it. But the top part of our brain where we can think rationally, we can go, okay, maybe there's a strategy that next time it can be different. So that's what we're trying to override and we get hijacked and that, and that anxiety feels our body and our heads are just flooded with negative thoughts. It's the emotional brain taken over where feelings become facts and that's why we can have that anxiety playing soccer. It feels like it's the worst thing ever, therefore it is. And if it really was the worst thing that ever happened to me in my entire life, losing the ball at midfield and the team scoring, it'd be a great idea to never do that again, right? But that's a feeling, it's not a fact. The fact is it's a mistake. The other team scored. I hurt, I'm upset by it, my teammates aren't happy, but I can try to get better. I can learn from it and improve. And then now I view it as an opportunity to grow. I can learn from this. I'm way more motivated in practice to work on my first touch. I'm gonna to really pay attention to Wells and go, Wells, dude, give me a couple of tips. How do I shield that ball better when it comes to me on my weak foot? And that's a lot of what we're trying to do with the players we work with, right? Help them understand why they get hijacked, why the emotion takes over, why they all of a sudden go that negative kind of rabbit hole and how to pull them out and how to help them have strategies to override that animal part of our brain with the thinking part of our brain. And if we have a plan and are prepared, we can really override that emotional hijacking and we can perform the way we want to in those difficult situations. Do you use a lot of visualization? There's some echoes on it. A lot of visualization to help with that. And, you know, they always talk about you need to visualize yourself in winning positions like lifting trophies and this and that. But then how do you counteract that with you know, visualizing something bad happening, even though it's to the solution, to find solutions you know, for it? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's, it, it's really interesting because a lot of visualization, a lot of talks over the years has really been focused much more on positive visualization, right? It's like uh, Tiger Woods, I'm gonna visualize you know, the perfect game, Michael Phelps, I'm gonna visualize the perfect race. And it really does have a lot of value. And it, it's kind of cool how it works, right? That it's sort of like, think about uh, the last time, Brandon, you saw a scary movie and our suspenseful movie, right? And something's about to happen and all of a sudden the character's about to get hurt or attacked or something bad and you kind of go, oh, oh! And you find yourself kind of pulling back, right? And cringing that that's the emotional part of our brain, right? It feels like it's real. Now the thinking part of our brain is like, bro, like you know that guy was in a movie six months ago in like a romantic comedy and he's laughing it up with his buddies and she was in a movie three months ago where she was like a teacher in preschool. So you know this isn't real, right? They're just getting paid, they do this, entertain you and then afterwards they go, you know, cut, set, nobody's really dead and they all just go get drinks and have fun, right? That's the thinking brain. My emotional brain is like all caught up, right? And that's why sometimes after watching a movie, like, man, that was awful. And it stays with us because the emotional brain is still wrapped up, right? So with visualization, that's why visualization works because when we imagine something, it feels real to the emotional part of our brain. It feels as if we actually did that thing. And so it feels like we're experienced now. So if Michael Phelps visualizes the perfect race over and over and over and over. And he started this, I guess, when he was maybe 12, 13, that by the time you get, imagine doing that for five years, every night before you go to bed, you visualize the perfect race. It's like in your brain, the emotional part of the brain, you actually did that. You performed it perfectly for all those years. So when you're in those moments, your confidence is higher. Your belief that you can do it is higher. So that's the real value of that sort of positive visualization, right? The piece that we like to add to that is that negative visualization and what you, you don't want to just do it like in a catastrophic way. Like, okay, I want to visualize me playing soccer. I score an own goal. Um, I get a red card for, you know, punching somebody in the first 10 minutes. Uh, I tell my coach he's a horrible person and, you know, my teammates hate me. My coach kicks me out the team. My parents are so embarrassed to make me walk home and I don't play the rest of the season. So that would not be a great thing to visualize, right? So it's not about just catastrophe. What you wanna do is go, you know what? My game is gonna be a combination of experiences. Some things are gonna go really well and I wanna visualize those things going well. I wanna think about that and feel that, right? And a lot of detail, the more detail we can do that, the better that I'm experiencing me having a good first touch, connecting on my passes, winning those one-on-one -on -one, you know, battles in midfield. So visualizing those things is really important. 
and feeling confident as I do, right? You visualize those things, very, very important. What you also wanna visualize is a couple adversities you're gonna experience. We don't always know what those things are gonna look like. We don't know exactly how they're gonna play out, but we know we're gonna have some adversity, right? Wells, how many times did you play soccer and it went exactly the way you pictured in your head? Never. Yeah. Brandon, how about you? Never. You, yeah, never, right? So if we tell ourselves, hey, some things are gonna go really well today and I'm gonna have some struggles, right? My first touch is gonna get away from me. I'm gonna turn the ball over, right? I'm, I'm going to uh, miss an opportunity right in front of the goal, right? That, that's just a gimme, right? Those things can happen. So what I can do is I can visualize a couple of things adversely I'm going to experience. And then I'm going to visualize me feeling kind of overwhelmed, mad or stressed and some negative thoughts coming in. And then I'm going to visualize how I cope. And that's the really important piece, right? We want to visualize how we're going to cope. So if I'm playing midfield, I'm closing my eyes and imagine me doing well, making some you know, pass, passes, connecting, going up top, shutting them down when they're coming back on attack of the team. Okay, it's going well. And then, oh man, I lose the ball at midfield. They are on a counter. And I'm going to visualize myself going, oh man. And I'm going to then think, recover, recover, recover. And I'm going to run back as fast as I can, try to get back behind the ball, support someone who's covering for me, try to win possession back and stop them from scoring. So if I visualize that in my brain, it's as if I actually did it. So I visualize me being successful and doing some things well, some things I've prepared for and practiced, you know, that, that I've worked on those skills. I visualize those going well. And I visualize me making some mistakes, having some setbacks and how I recover, what I do next. And so important is that visualization part about how we cope. And when you put those together, then you really have a more accurate description of what you're expecting. And when we know what to expect and the brain knows what to expect, it doesn't sound the alarm bell. We don't go into fight, flight, or freeze. We just go, oh, that sucked, but how do I deal with it? And we do the next play and we recover and get back behind the ball. All right. Very well uh, explained. Yeah, you know, Wells actually came up with this, the, the knacker and the triple P's. You want to tell me what the triple P's are, Wells? Yeah, triple P's. So predict, plan, and then practice. Um, so predict what's going to happen, have a plan for it, and then practice it. So, and, and you do this all the time in soccer, right? Like you, whether it's, you know, a man down, um, five minutes to go, down by a goal, like – you know, you run through these different scenarios um, in practice that that you might experience in a game so that when you actually get into the game, then you're prepared for it. Yeah, hey, Wells, could you share that story about what you guys did at Wake with Jay and Bobby? Yeah, so, yeah, so statistically, um, when you look at college soccer, I'm assuming it's the same from when my time was, but the majority of goals are scored five minutes into a half, five minutes when the game starts, five minutes before the half, five minutes after the half, five minutes before the game ends or five minutes after a goal is scored. Um, so one of the things that we did at Wake was we, uh, we, we practiced this, right? So like if a goal was scored, we'd always, we'd always remind each other five minutes, five minutes, five minutes, right? Whether it was scored on us or whether we scored a goal. Um, as the game was starting five minutes, because we knew that if we weathered those very important and critical times in a game, um, the, the, more, the, the better our chance to win, right? And so, um, you know, this is what we ran through all the time. Like if it was in practice, goal was scored, we would practice this five minutes, five minutes, five minutes. Everybody knew what five minutes meant, right? And so that's just a, an example of one of the things we used to do awake. Do you think it's, it's because people lose focus in those five minutes and aren't fully switched on? Yeah, well, I mean, I think if you think of if, so, if, if you score a goal, right, you're like you're feeling good, you're positive, and then think about how that affects the other team. They're they're pissed, they're motivated, so it's almost like you you relax a little bit, you take your foot off the gas, and so it's important just to remind yourself five minutes. We've got to um, withstand their pissed offness and their desire to to even the score. Um, as soon as they can. And so uh, the, if you can withstand those five minutes, um, the better it is for you. And so I think too, you know, you, you relate that to the beginning of the game and to the end of the game or to the beginning of the, or to the end of the half and to the beginning of the half, it's kind of the same concept, same philosophy is 
you know, the beginning of the game, your jitters are up, your nerves, you're not settled in. Uh, maybe the before the half ends, you, you know, you're taking your foot off the gas. You're, man, I need a break. I need water. Whatever it is, like your thoughts and your focus is going to control what happens, right? So if you can, and this brings up a good point. One of the things that I feel like um, psychology or mental toughness, it's really, um, it's a, it's looked at from an individual perspective. And so it's like, obviously there's a lot of individuality in it. What are my thoughts? Um, but one of the things that me and Brad are, are passionate about is it's really a team thing, right? Um, because we're all fighting a battle. And so if we know that we, we understand that we're fighting battles in our heads, well, how can we then look to our teammate and say, if he, if he screws up, right, makes a bad play, makes an own goal, well, how can I help him then respond in uh, an appropriate and the, the best way possible, right? Because it's a team sport. And so I want my teammates to be on the same kind of uh, mindset and same mind frame as me. Um, so how, as a good teammate, can I, can I lift him up or can I encourage him to um, respond positively and not negatively? So it's almost like you need to train the team to be clinical psychologists on the field because the coach is too far away to, to do it. So you need that partner right next to you. Yeah, I mean, no doubt. I think there's a, there's stigma and stereotype over psychologists or counselors. I think one of the things that um, I've been blessed with is I've, I've seen counselors and psychologists my whole life because I've been so screwed up, right? Like, I mean, seriously, like my parents took me to see counselors and stuff. And so I just, I, re, I really reached a point when I at a young age where I was like, I have no problem with this. I, I see a psychologist, I see a counselor. And it's actually really funny if you break it down, think about the importance that society puts on mentors or puts on um, coaches, right? And um, well, how is a psychologist or a counselor not looked at in that same light? Uh, you know, I'm the first one to raise my hand and say, I'm jacked up. I need help. Like, um, can you help me? And so, um, yeah, it's, it's definitely something that I think, and, and as, as boys, you know, me and Brad talk about this all the time. What is our, what is our perspective or, or how are we um, um, received uh, by girls versus boys, by teenagers versus college players, by college players versus, versus pro players? And obviously, I think the older that you get, the more hopefully maturity you have and perspective you have and you understand these things. And the challenge is um, trying to get younger kids, maybe especially younger boys, to, to, to buy in. You guys spoke about, I think it's even in the title of your, your company or, or your logo, motto, motto about the word resilience. Can you elaborate more into what that means for you, resilience? Yeah, so our company, I'm going to let Brad take this, but our company is Soccer Resilience. But go ahead, Brad, take it away. Yeah, so, you know, you know it's funny because, like, the, uh, the standard definition, right, of, of resilience is kind of like you have adversity, you have a difficult situation, you're able to adapt and, you know, navigate it, and you bounce back pretty quick. And, you know, I think a thing for Wells and I, right, that, that resilience, and, and I say this to so many clients that I work with, right, that resilience, it does not mean I'm not phased by something. It doesn't mean that I'm like just things bounce off me and like nothing, you know, phases me and I keep going, right? That, you know, there is some resilience in that, right? But so much resilience comes from when things are hard, when you're struggling, right? When you don't have maybe as much confidence in you, right? When the anxiety is getting the better of you and you have the strength to say, you know what, this is going on. I want to try to improve it. And to me, such a huge part of resilience is that ability to be open, right? to be vulnerable, to acknowledge, hey, this is a challenge because now the door is out there, right? And, and really, to me, such a key of resilience, you know, Wells and I talk about this a lot, is I think, one, you got to know your why, right? You got to have the reason that you're doing it. And that helps buffer you. It's like a, you know, like a, a shield. It's like a bulletproof vest. You know, it's like when you have your why, it's like things can still hit you, they can still knock you down, but you're a lot more able to kind of get back up. So to me, a huge part of resilience is kind of knowing your why, like what's your motivation. So you know, even like today, right, Brandon, this is my first podcast. As you can tell, Wells has done this many times. This is a new one for me, right? Really nervous. I was like, Brad, what's your why? What's why? Why are you doing this? They go, this is a chance to speak to people. And maybe one person will hear something and go, yeah, that was kind of helpful. 
I'll try that. And now maybe they become more open to other ideas, right? So to me, with soccer resilience, right, it's a huge part about knowing your why. You got to have that motivation because when things are tough, if your motivation is low, you stop, right? Wells ran 100 miles, 100 miles. Brandon, I probably haven't run 100 miles in 10 years. Mm -hmm. Wells <laughs> ran 100 miles, right? I got bad knees. But Wells found a way to do that, right? He had a why, right? What was your why, Wells? Why, why run 100 miles? Um, so I ran 100 miles. Can you hear me? Yeah, I ran 100 miles to raise money to dig clean water wells in Africa. Yeah, so there's a lot of people. It's mind-boggling, right? There's people still around the world that don't have access to clean water. And it's, uh, I, I'm going to get this stat wrong, but like kills a lot of people, right? So if they don't have clean water, what are they drinking? They got to drink something. They drink dirty water, which ends up killing them. And so, yeah, we, uh, praise God, man, we raised over $20,000. Um, it was a really kind of last minute thing and we, we, we had to adapt because of COVID. Um, but really we fundraised for two weeks, raised over $20,000 and we ended up building two school wells, um, in Kenya. Um, so thousands and thousands of kids, actually the wells have already been built. So as we speak, have access to clean drinking water. That's awesome. So I'm sure that was in whenever those you know when at mile 50 were you thinking of those kenyan kids oh absolutely and and i've been over there i've i've, I've experienced that that sort of poverty before and so i what i did i printed out pictures um that uh, so i ran for a, a nonprofit called hydrating humanity and so they've been building for the last 15 years clean water wells in in kenya and mainly kenya and tanzania so I printed out some of the pictures of the projects that they had done and I had them posted um, around the trail that I was running. So just to remind myself that it's not, it's not about me. It's a, it's about, um, it's about other people and it's about um, raising money and also awareness, right? Because I mean, here in America, we, if our water's not, I mean, my kids ask me, my kids sometimes won't drink water if I don't put ice in it. And I'm like, what is wrong with you? You know, and, and, and it's not them, right? It's, it's, uh, it's, we have all have a selfish nature. I mean, I'm the same way, right? If my coffee's not hot enough or whatever, like I, I get up, my panties in a wad. And uh, so it's just, it's gaining that perspective that, and again, goes back to you focus on, um, you got to focus on the good or the bad. And uh, I think one of the, it's funny, Brad always reminds me, our nanny left us a couple of weeks ago. So I've been home with the kids for, for two weeks hardest job in the world. And Brad's like, great way to build resilience. And I'm like, no, man, it's not. This is freaking hard. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm apologizing to my kids all the time. I'm a freaking mess. But he's right, you know, and it's, um, I, I'm such a big believer. Like, I didn't win. I didn't uh, learn a lot by winning MLS Cup. I didn't learn a lot by, like, being drafted. But I tell you, I learned a lot by being shipped off to, to dumbass school. I learned a lot like being at a contract and nobody wanted to pick me up. I learned a lot sitting on the bench. I learned a lot not even making the roster, right? And so like I say this often, but the lessons suck. They really suck to learn. And so I'm, I'm speaking from my perspective, but everything that I've gone through that's hard, like as I come out the other side, I'm thankful. Like retiring for post sports was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. I, for 30 years I have a soccer ball in front of me and then it's not there anymore. And who am I? Right. Um, but I know that God had to take me through that to teach me I'm more than an athlete and that's not who I am and, and that sort of thing. So um, the hard things are the good things. It's just, again, how we, how do we view them? How do we, um, how do we process them? How do we let them affect us? And from what you said about you have a podcast now where you help other athletes go through that so like if you were to have that tough lesson of going through the process of who am i now you wouldn't be able to help these people that you're helping now yeah yeah i mean it's you know the most asked question i got as a pro is what will you do when you're done playing i mean the average career is what 2.7 years something like that like i knew i knew that i would do something after it's the that's the biggest challenge it was convincing pro athletes that they um they need to to in order to prepare well they need to start while they're playing and so um i just didn't understand that i mean we you need to get quincy amiraqua on your podcast i don't know if you know who he is but mls guy he is a mental strength coach quincy, and a, what was his last name? 
it's a Miracle. I'm probably going to butcher it, but um, he is um, a really a great guy. And so he, we, we just interviewed him for the podcast and he said, Wells, you know, so I was a one trick pony. It, it, like everywhere I went, I was Wells Thompson, the soccer player. And if you ask me what I did or who I was, I played soccer. That's what I did. Well, Quincy had the perspective that he was an entrepreneur and his side hustle was soccer. So who do you think is going to be more prepared for life after sport, him or me? And so he's, he's actually a free agent. He's currently still playing or trying to play if the right offer comes by. But I mean, he's, he started several businesses before he even um, stopped playing. And so he is, you know, he's got other things to fill his time. And I think that there's a myth that if we don't put a hundred percent of our time into the sport, well, then we're cutting ourselves short. And I don't believe that to be the case. I believe that actually it creates balance and health if we have outside interests. And so part of it for me or, or for most athletes is like, I don't even know what I like to do. I mean, right. It's like, I, I mean, think about the sacrifices I made as a pro athlete for soccer. Like my weekends, my holidays, my everything, what I ate, who I hung out with, my, you know, everything I did, the money I spent was soccer. And so when I don't have that, it's like, what do I like to do? I don't even know. I mean, like I didn't read, this is, a, this is probably the serious truth, but it's sad. I didn't read a full book till after college. It's like, I mean, I, was, I always hear those pro athletes be like, you know, you know, focus on your books. Don't just focus on sports. I'm like, why? I just want to play soccer, you know? And so I don't think I, I don't think I knew that I was thinking those thoughts. And, um, you know, a lot of it was probably just immaturity and not understanding that, like, I'm going to live the majority of my life without soccer, hopefully, right? God willing. And, but I lived my whole life, like I was going to play soccer for the rest of my life. Right. And so that's a harsh reality when it's not there anymore. Yeah. I, uh, I know the feeling. I don't know if Brad told you um, what I told him about my story, but uh, I was in a car wreck about, 15 years ago and you know before that I lived breathed and slept soccer I grew up in Brazil lived there for 10 years from like 8 to 18 so like that's all you do in Brazil is play soccer so yeah. so my sense of like who am I had was just like the rug was taken out from under me and I it took a while for me to you know figure out who am I without soccer but now I found a way that I can be involved in it and help soccer players and not need to be the one on the field. So, so you're in a wheelchair now. Correct. Yeah. That's amazing, man. I was actually going to ask, um, after the show, what, what the wheelchair was about. Cause I heard you mention it before. And, um, one of the things I always talk about, it's, it's really funny if you think about like pro athletes and the platform and how society views them, right? They're heroes because they shoot a basket or kick a, kick a ball. And I'm like, no, like, Brandon, you're the hero, man. Like, you're the hero for in, enduring this and going through it and staying positive and continue to, like, use who you are for good. Like, man, I'm, I, I'm getting chills just thinking about it. And, and I love this by Matthew McConaughey. He says, unbelievable is the stupidest word in the English dictionary because we as human beings continue to defy the odds. I mean, it's unbelievable, right? You're in a, you, you live and breathe soccer. You're in a car wreck. And you have to do that in a different way now. And so I believe that the, the more that we can share our struggles and, and Brad, Brad hit on earlier, like the more we're vulnerable, the more we share our struggles, the more we share our, um, our shortcomings. Like that's why I'm the first one to say I'm a jacked up individual, man, because I, I believe that people gravitate way more to those things than they do like, Hey, I want them less cup. You know, there's like, Oh, what a, kind of a douche here. Right. Like, <laughs> and, Cause no one walks around saying that, but um, at the end of the day, we're more alike than we are different. And we all go through freaking hard things. And so it's, it's uh, man, I'm, I'm proud of you, brother. You, it's such an encouragement just to hear that. Thank you, Wells. I really appreciate that. I mean, yeah, on Facebook, when uh, I saw you, I don't know if that was the first time you got out of your wheelchair to walk on, on the walker. And, uh, and, 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 and I just, you know, as well said, right. I mean, I just had this like, wow, like that's resilience right there. Like I saw it on your face, right. You're like, I'm going to figure out how to make these legs go. I'm going to figure out how to make them go forward and to keep going and keep going. And I saw the progression, right. Of what you posted. And, you know, for any of you here in this, you know, to, to see Brandon's Facebook and, you know, it is like, like, like those to me, honestly, as, as, as just a person, even as a psychologist, but those are the most powerful moments of life to me is like when you see, 
you know, like watching you, right? You, you have a hardship, it's incredibly difficult, awful things happen to you and you find a way to say, okay, what am I going to do with it? Right. You created a podcast. Do you think you would have made this podcast if someone had asked you, you know, 30 years ago, you would have been like, or 20 years ago, yeah, I'll, I'll be making a podcast. No. So, you know, you, you, you finding a way to do that and, and, and that's the, the inspiration. So, you know, people hear about your story, they listen to your podcast and, and, you know, just who you are, the way you carry yourself. Right. And I, I love that, uh, that picture of you with a, is it Roger State University? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I saw you guys uh, went to PKs. Sounds like an exciting uh, championship way to win. It was. It was. It, it was insane. It was, it was unbelievable. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And you using that to kind of help inspire them, right? And encourage them, teach them. Um, and that's a beautiful thing. Thank you. Thank you. Well, guys, I think this is a, a good place to wrap up. How would someone contact you guys if they want to hire you guys for their, their soccer team? What's the best way to get in touch with you guys? Yeah, I think um, so. Um, we're in the process of getting our website up and running. They can access. Um, we've got a landing page currently on my website at wellsthompsonsoccer.com. Uh, my email is wells at soccerresilience.com and and Dr. Brad is uh, Dr. Brad Miller, Miller at soccerresilience.com. One of my favorite things to do is give out my cell phone number. My cell phone is 336-575-3324. I encourage anyone and everyone to give me a call, um, just to chat, say, hey, ask a question. Um, so, yeah, you can, put that, you can put all that stuff in the show notes, man. I will. I will, for sure. Cool. Well, thank you so much for it, man. I feel like I've made two new, two new friends for life today. Yeah, babe, uh, back at you, brother. Back, I'm going to yeah, check you so much. Yeah, I'm going to check out your Facebook page, man. I had no idea coming into this interview that, um, um, about your story, man. And so keep sharing your story, brother. I think that's one of the coolest things is we all have a story and, uh, we've all been through crap. And I think that there's healing in, in, in sharing that. And um, because Both there's ways for me and who I share it with. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, I, I'm reminded of myself every time I talk that I'm preaching to myself, I'm speaking to myself, like all of these things I talk about. I think sometimes we think that if you're listening to me talking, like I practice those things all the time. I don't. And I, I try to. Right. Um, but it's it's it brings back perspective. Um, just hearing yourself talk about it and trying to implement those things in your life. Definitely. So if there's a, anything we can do for you, brother, give us a shout, man. Yeah. Cool. We'd love to support you and what you're doing too. Cool. Cool. All right, guys. Uh, we're going to call it a day. Thanks again. Have a wonderful day and good luck with soccer resilience. And uh, we'll be in touch. Sounds hey, good, brother. Uh, Thank you, buddy. Hey, All right. if, if you want uh, Quincy's info, um, I can shoot it to you. Okay. I'll make definitely. a connection. Definitely. So cool. Well, shoot me, a shoot me a message offline with your info. All right. We'll do. All right, Brandon. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Take care. See y'all.